Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in to the Share Giving Podcast. The podcast can be found wherever podcasts are distributed, and prior episodes are also housed on our website, along with lots of archival video and other interesting and relevant material at ShareGiverSolutions.com. I'm Rob Stoller, your host, along with my brother David. Hello, everyone. Who has been caring for his wife, Barbara, since she was diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's over a decade ago. Today, we'll be presenting the second installment of A Day in the Life of a Sharegiver, that sharegiver being David. Last week, David walked us through a typical morning, which is rarely typical, and today we will look at what the afternoon often holds. David, let's go. Thanks, Rob. We finished a morning. Yeah. We'd, we'd had morning coffee. You'd taken a ride. Uh, how we, are we, we doing did. today? Yeah, we broke the bear. We broke the bear. Repair the bear. We, we repaired the bear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's continue. I think hopefully it's helpful to everybody who's listening, uh, certainly to see that you're not alone and far from it. But hopefully as well, there is some advice and uh, preparation for some obstacles that yeah. perhaps can be avoided. Yeah. I mean, this morning's a good example. You came and uh, as you typically do, said, hello, beautiful. I love you to Barbara. Uh, this time she was a little less than uh, welcoming. Yes, I was not particularly lovingly received. I told her her hair looked beautiful, which it did. And uh, she insulted me. In, uh, and her, the words weren't there, but the tone was certainly yeah. clear. And, uh, and then what happened? And then David said, I'm going to put on some Ella Fitzgerald. And as soon as she sang a tisket, a tasket, Barbara started dancing. And actually, she had rebuffed David. His famous hug method had not been effective this morning. As soon as the music came on, she started dancing and went over and gave you a hug and a kiss. And when I put my arms out? Started dancing. We started dancing. Together. Yeah, it was quite, uh, quite pretty, stunning. Pretty ably, I would say. Right? Yeah, I think she was better than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it really was quite striking to witness the transformation in in the matter of an instant from angry, right. for what reasons were not quite clear, to joyous. Yeah, I think a couple of things to note. Number one, music once again has a magical property. And she immediately started dancing and danced her way up the stairs. Yes, she did. Uh, as if she were being filmed. And was, uh, uh, similarly, when we danced together, it was like we were right off a dance floor 40 years ago. Yeah. Didn't really miss a step. Nothing was awkward. And uh, kisses were exchanged freely. <laughs> yeah. And that's the second point, is that afterwards, she was in a much better frame of mind. No question. So, uh, yeah, this is, again, an example of finding something that works. And I would think that in many, if not most cases, music works. And uh, to the extent that it can be combined with something physical, so not just sitting and listening, but moving, it's really powerful. And, uh, and then once again, that physical contact for me and Barbara is key, and it uh, chases a bad mood like nothing else. I would imagine, I mean, obviously Ella was the way to go this morning. Oh, yeah, Perhaps no, I, something else may sure. not have had the same. I have my rotation. Four Seasons gets her up and going every time. Sherry, Sherry, baby. baby. Sherry, 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 baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, the Beach Boys or, yeah, anything that is uh, bopping and has rhythm and she will respond immediately. Yeah. And, and I imagine if there are times when she's kind of hyper excited and uh, it's not working, maybe you'll put on a little James Taylor yeah. or soothing yeah, music. Something is more couch oriented. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, these are things that I think everybody finds uh, a way back to normal or as close to it as we can get. And, and uh, I have my my music set and also it is why as we've mentioned before having a device like uh i won't say the whole thing because she'll Alexa, Alexa. 
Right. Say it too loud. She'll start playing. She's over there. (laughs) She's everywhere. (laughs) Um, I have things during the day that she comes on automatically, beginning in the morning with Barbara Cook, as we talked about before. I thought uh, picking up from where we left off, uh, something useful to talk about would be when we go on our road trips or we have an adventure or we have an outing. And I try to plan that. Uh, one of those every day. It always, almost always involves a car. It's not a walk. We do a lot of walks in the garden, and a walk is good, but it is getting in the car with a destination. It is something that she has always enjoyed. It is more challenging now uh, for reasons that we can talk about, mm. but going on a trip, which we've all loved anyway, right? Uh, she still loves it. And the car is sort of that gateway. So I thought maybe I would address some of the things that we do and how that has changed over time. I mean, we have been big museum, art gallery, theater, orchestra, movies, sports. Probably to a greater extent than any couple I've ever known. Uh, Not as much the sporting events. Those are typically for your daughters and you. Oh, but Yankees. Yankees. She's a big Yankee fan. Theater, music, dance, orchestra. You guys were. Yeah. Were. Um, yeah. Enthusiastic were, members. Were is the operative word. And yeah. I mean, I'm aware that uh, many in the audience are maybe in a different place. And uh, I would encourage uh, those ac- kind of activities because to the extent the the person you're caring for you know, can sit sit still and appreciate it, then it's enriching. And, and it's also an activity that is stimulating intellectually and emotionally. And it may have a deeper effect than you're even aware. Correct. So when um, we originally uh, would go to these events and uh, Barbara would really be excited about it, including, you know, most readily movies. Um, we uh, we have tr- we try that on occasion now, and thank goodness for streaming and television because we can have that content, and we do it every day. We we watch something, I would say, every single night, starting at seven o'clock until she's ready to go to sleep, which is usually around eight eight thirty. But when we went to the movies, we always enjoyed it, and then. Barbara started to get more and more restless to the point that we moved to the back of the theater, we moved to the end of the row in the theater, and finally we moved out of the theater. And I, um, because these were neighborhood uh, facilities, I would tell the folks when we'd get our tickets, you may be seeing me before the movie is out. Uh, I promise we won't be disruptive, and if it's early enough in the movie, Maybe we can get a refund. And I would always say that to the point that they'd say, we know, enjoy, hopefully we'll, we don't see you before the end. So that was a strategy. And ultimately, I had to use that for virtually everything. And that's a typical preparation. Correct. I, I, and, and I don't know that you've done it much, but I know that people hand out cards Yeah. that, that forewarn the people in the place that, my wife is dealing with something, so has occasional outbursts. That's a great point. So let me address that. Yeah. The first time I used that was a card prepared by somebody. It might have been the Dementia Society, somebody. But it was a very dense card. You know, it tried to explain too much. Mm. And also, I learned that it depended on who I was giving it to, whether it, number one, had its desired effect or it could be off-putting, which I'll give examples. Sure. But suffice it to say, for me, the, the best use of it was in restaurants. Um, and even restaurants are hard for us to go to now because Barbara's inclined to get up and walk around. She has, uh, you know, this psychic mobility agitation that you know seems to emerge wherever we are but um, we'd go to a restaurant and I would have a very simple card that I'd give to the server I'm with my wife 
she's fabulous and she has dementia. You know, please be... Uh, understanding. Understanding, exactly. Mm. That's all I would write. Yeah. And it always worked. Uh, well, I think these days it, it works because, A, you hit some people who are just considerate by nature or understand. B, this is not far afield from anybody's experience. Correct. Now, that said, if we're at the Philadelphia Orchestra or we're in the theater understanding doesn't work yeah and in fact well you haven't explained it to the whole audience but even the people sitting on either side are not really interested they're not prepared to be that understanding well, they paid their money too they paid their money and if barbara is talking and distracting they really are not going to be understanding or if she's singing along which she would do if she knows the song <laughs> not understanding so uh, once again I had to, when we were still going to the orchestra or to the theater, we would sit in the back and we would sit on the end. And at the first such moment, I would try once or twice, Barbara, yeah, can't talk. If that didn't work, mm. uh, then we'd go. Yeah. So a card is really good, but only in certain places. If we go on a guided tour, of a garden or even a museum and we're with a group I will talk to the tour guide directly and I'll say there's a possibility that you know my wife could be disruptive and not intending to but mm. may come up and ask you questions or uh, in which case just wanted you to know so it doesn't throw you off and I, if it's really disruptive then we'll go uh, but you know, wanted to know. They always appreciate it. And generally, especially if we're outside, we can wander off and come back. Yeah, that's a more forgiving environment yeah, than the a, theater. In a museum, it's, you know, possible, although uh, not so easy. But I will always give advance notice if there are other people involved. I think also when we go to a museum now, and because, you know, Barbara has always loved it. And I, there's always that fine line of wanting to enable her to experience things that she loved, but being very aware that I don't want her to embarrass herself or inconvenience other people. Didn't you tell me that you did something recently where you kind of got in before the general public or Correct. they allowed you in or something? What was that? Correct. Yes, that was an art show here in New Hope. And uh, we went and I knew the person that was running at New Hope Arts. And she basically closed the doors to the public <laughs> while we were in so we could take a spin around ourselves, which was incredibly... Uh, that person's a shareholder. Yeah, she is a shareholder, And she knew Barbara. And of course, Barbara used to be on the board of that very organization, mm. which makes it all the more poignant. But um, yeah, I have now been prepared for those things to also move really fast. So if we go to a museum, you know, unfortunately I like to linger. This was a problem when we were happily married and Barbara was uh, fully sensible. She always wanted to go fast anyway and I always wanted to look and talk. So that hasn't changed, but now we go fast. We go so fast, in fact, that uh, it almost operates like before I said a bark Instead of yelling or being upset, yeah, just like a bark. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm iffy on that bark, but we'll talk well, about that, I, I that another it might time. Be of some controversy among our audience, yeah. but I find that it works great. It's the same thing going to a museum. I will pull her through that museum quickly, so she doesn't really have time. To... <laughs> Mona Lisa's eyes are like whip. <laughs> <laughs> they still follow us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's another thing. I want her to see it, but I don't want to linger too much because then that kind of uh, kinetic energy will uh, take over. Yeah. Same thing in gardens. We don't linger. We walk. But we're out, and it's a chance for her. So all of these activities, I find a way to enjoy them or some 
semblance of what was an experience that she always did enjoy, but making sure that we're respecting, you know, the privacy or the enjoyment of other people mm. that, you know, didn't go there to necessarily be understanding. Yeah, there are so many layers to it. You need and want to enjoy the experience, whereby the whole time you're hoping Barbara's gaining something from it and enjoying the experience. And I know that's hard. It's hard to be fully engaged with the work and fully engaged with Barbara. Right. So what I do, I mean, and it's a great example. And again, I'm luckier than many that I'm able to hire somebody that gives me some time during the day, uh, still not on weekends, but and I may do that as well, at least one day uh, where I'll go back and see things myself or with a friend if uh, if it would bother me so that it doesn't bother me. Yeah. So that I'm prepared to do, you know, a quick review, but take so, care of my own interests. So we've uh, invoked that sort of caveat that you are able to have some help. Christina comes some hours each yeah. weekday. And you've got a trainer who comes in two days a week, and for, for Barbara, yeah. for Barbara, yeah, um, and which and, is also interesting. We'll come back to it, but uh, Barbara knows her. Yeah, she likes that activity, and she also certainly called you David when we walked in the door. Although I think she was looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I think she has been confused well, people uh, from say time. We look I'm yeah, a I'm a lot than handsomer than uh, yeah. you are. Okay. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think my point initially was uh, for those in our audience who uh, are not in a position to have help come in. Uh, this is really uh, directed at you more pointedly. I think it's more critical that you engage your network. Of, of friends and family to at least spell you when possible. You have to probably make a more concerted effort to engage people in the situation. Right. Yeah, and I, it's a great point because uh, that network, that personal network of friends and family, especially, I mean, we use the word respite, I think just too generally, Yeah. right? Uh, that everybody needs respite. I'm not really sure what that means other than, you know, being away from the action, as it were. I think to the extent that I could say to one of my daughters to make a date to be here or to friends that are local friends or old friends that, uh, you know, I've scheduled some time. I want to go to the museum or I want to go to these galleries or I'm having a lunch with somebody or an anniversary dinner. Uh, I sort of know my schedule in advance and, and people are absolutely thrilled to do that. That is yeah. meaningful uh, opportunity for them to give something. So yeah. that's where the network really comes and, from. And thinking about it now, uh, if you sort of, we always referred to it as a bullpen in the past. If you have your stable of relief pitchers, so to speak, right. they'll get better. And more comfortable. Right. And and we had talked originally about kind of training caregivers through this. Yeah. And I think that concept is still alive in that these people who uh, agree and are happy to give you some time and spend time with Barbara, understanding it won't be the same as the time they spent with her some years back. I am sure that it's easier the second time than the first time. Yeah. The shock factor is less. Right. And I again, I think for those who are really alone in this share giving, I don't think there's a need to be alone. And I think you have to put in the effort to ask for help. And, and schedule it. I mean, the best thing to do is to make a list of everybody you know that, you know, has had a relationship with Barbara and you're reasonably sure would want to help. Particularly when they've said, let me know if there's Correct. anything I can ever do. So you put a calendar together and you call them and you say either, I know I'm going to need help on this day coming up or take a look at this. 
and put down a day that you can either bring lunch or uh, come for dinner or give me a break that I can go to a movie or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, uh, and it works. You know? Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the bullpen analogy, I think, is a good one. And I know I have done this. So we're, you know, baseball guys. So mm. we know in a bullpen you got a guy that provides long relief who may be called early in the game because the starting pitcher's gotten bombed and you need him to give you solid four innings or so that you can get back in the game, right? Or you have short relief where you need a couple of innings, hopefully, to get you to the closer. And then you need firemen, like all of a sudden, disaster. Pitcher's blowing up, you got to get somebody warmed up. And, in and to make it real, you get a call. You need to go meet somebody yeah. in, in a half an hour. Right. You'll be gone for an hour. Right. And you need somebody who can come or, for an hour. Or, yeah, in my case, I find out the, the morning, uh, the day that my caregiver uh, right. can't come. Yeah. Her kid's sick. She's got to go to the doctor. That's happened a lot. A lot. So I need to know <clears throat> how to handle it. Now, I obviously can handle it myself unless I have something critical that I had planned, at least for part of that day. So, yeah. It is all, as you said before, anticipating what could go wrong and being ready for it, either in your planning for assistance or just in a moment. And uh, kind of worst case scenario, you have a day planned. Christina calls and says she can't make it. If you don't have somebody warm up, warmed up in the bullpen, you may have to change your plans. Oh, yeah. And you have to be prepared to do that without being angry and resentful exactly. about it. Yeah, it's just the same thing as it's like any of these things. That is that is mindset. Yeah. And and I'm so convinced we harp on this that that mindset can be rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed so that it becomes automatic. That happened. OK, I'll figure it out. I'll do something else. I'll get on the phone. This happened. Sorry, we need to reschedule. Yeah. Uh, and everybody's always cool. It's, right. The you're, you're the one that... Well, that's that's the only blessing here is that it's not going to shock anybody. Yeah. Even if they don't know Barbara and they don't know the situation, they know that this exists yeah. in our society. And it's going to continue and increase, unfortunately. Yeah. So I think there's a, a growing sense of understanding. Yeah, and I think... the most important understanding is your own. Mm. And uh, my understanding is that more important than anything else is my peace of mind. Yeah. That's what I'm protecting. Correct. That's what I'm nourishing. And that's the great benefit. Which is your health. Which is my health. Yeah. Yeah. It directly relates to stress, which directly relates to inflammation, yep. which causes all kinds of, you know, crappy things to happen. It's at the root of a lot of bad right. things. Exactly. I mean, and again, I'm just with Barbara, you know, our household is ourselves. So it is a little easier to keep these things contained. But if I'm in a larger household, it becomes even more important. If I have kids or I have other people living, you know, there's the a great Jewish adage, which is so fundamental, which is Shalom Bayit, which is peace in the house. And in our religion, that is a principal cardinal virtue or attribute of a well-lived life is peace in the house that you can put before almost everything, your own pride or anger or needs or wants Peace in the house comes first. Remind me to share that with Amy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say it while you're running, right? Exactly. Peace in the house. Honey. Yeah, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think about that a lot, that there's so much that could be avoided or solved with understanding that. Well, I mean... Almost since I've known Amy, we're, we're, we're pretty different personalities. In fact, Amy got really upset with me at some point, And I realized she was angry 
that I seem under depressed, <laughs> that everything is going wrong, the world and is and crazy. Were, and you were superficial, Ron. No, not no, superficial, no, just, just under depressed. Yeah, okay. I was happier than I should be. <laughs> um, but I used to, I used to talk to Amy. I'll, I'll digress a little bit. There was an Indian. This is a digression. Yeah, that's well, okay. that's okay. There was an Indian story about the hawk and the eagle. Whereas the hawk is looking for a rabbit running in the grass. And the eagle is just looking for movement in the whole field. So I used to talk to Amy when she would get upset about something that uh, arguably, in my mind, was not terribly crucial. But she would really go off the deep end. And, and you I, would use this hawk and eagle with Amy? In, in the beginning, yeah. <laughs> I used that with the boys. They got it and liked it. But with Amy, it was more like, Try to see the big picture. We're, we're okay. We're, you know, look around and we're doing okay. Try to see the big picture instead of focusing on this thing. Uh, but after a while, she would get upset and I would say, Amy, and she would say, shut the bleep up about the big picture. I don't want to hear about the big, big, big picture. So she was, she was uh, normally and healthily depressed from time to time. And they were under depressed. For the most part. I mean, you know, if, uh, well, there are bills, there are cars, there are things with the house, there's everything. Right. Uh, I'm kind of like, it'll get done, okay. you know? And she is like, it's got to get done right now. <laughs> I was like, okay. But anyway, uh, yeah, Amy's not a fan of the big picture. But I think in this case, it's essential yeah. that you see the big picture. Yeah, and those words, shalom bayit. Peace in the house mm. is a, a big one for me. And it's probably not going to be a big one for me. <laughs> okay, we'll try it. <laughs> How do you say that in Italian? <laughs> <laughs> I think you say vino verità. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the big picture. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the, um, unfortunately, the fact is that most people that are in the position I'm in with Barbara are past a household full of kids, which is in itself isolating. And uh, I just uh, was sharing with you earlier that I have been trying to uh, share with my daughters, you know, if I come across a picture of them with their mother when they you know, are happy and because I want this to be the abiding mm. idea and image that they have of their mom. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I sent um, Molly one this morning. Gorgeous. A beautiful picture of her and Barbara. And I said, uh, Molly, I love this of you and your adoring mother. And uh, she then wrote back and she said, yeah, I love that picture. And here's another one that I love. And she sent me one from her wedding with her yeah. mother. The, the, the whole thing is, it's a matter of understanding and living with happy and sad at the same time. Right. So back on a trip uh, going out, uh, we also make trips to our family members, right? I mean, you know, I've learned that to the extent people can come here, it's better because if Barbara does get detached from what's going on, then she can wander around here and I worry less. Yeah. If she is somewhere else, number one, it's a little strange. And number two, I worry that, you know, she'll... Well, we found her next door to mom and dad's place with Correct. a fork in her hand. With a fork in her hand. In, in a stranger's house. Knocking on the door <laughs> with a fork in her hand. And yeah. a stranger... The neighbor got very uh, unnerved by it. Yeah. So, so yes, uh, uh, we entertain to the extent we do that here as much as possible. We always let people know who do know when they come over that don't take it personally if Barbara decides to exit the dinner table and start wandering around. It's okay. It's cool. I mean, she may well do that. When we travel to family or really to anything, there's also something that I call a depletion allowance that uh, I have found that Barbara, even in the best of circumstances, has an hour, an hour and a half before, 
you know, sh- can just get sour. Right. So you, you have to depleted. provide or prepare for the car ride to be part of that depletion. To, exactly. So the car ride counts. And I learned that, you know, after I would find we'd travel for an hour, an hour and a half. And by the time we got there, Barbara wanted to leave. She wanted no part of it. She was angry or upset. So, so I have to have that in mind. Now, what I do, quite frankly, is if we go an hour trip, then I'm going to give Barbara half a Xanax. That is time to take effect within 20 or 30 minutes. And you take the other half. <laughs> <laughs> and that works. You know, that'll spell some time. Uh, but again, to the extent, so, you know, we go over to Jessica's, want to see the grandkids. I want to be sure that Barbara has a chance to see them, but I'm watching the clock and I can tell when all of a sudden the movements become a little jerkier and the tone changes, we're ready to go. Well, I mean, that's that's also a, I guess depletion takes different forms. Sometimes it's just a mood, uh, an emotional depletion. If it's physical, there's, there's not much of a workaround other than to leave. Yeah, to leave. Yeah. Yeah. If we're there, if we're somewhere where we really can't leave so easily, then it becomes a walk around. I'll go out. We'll walk around. We'll Mm. do something that is diverting and, you know, come back and go again and come back. You know, we'll do that. How is Barbara with the grandkids? Yeah, it's uh, sad. Even on our refrigerator, we have a lot of pictures of her when she was very close with Eddie and nuzzling him and reading to him, even though even then reading was problematic. You know, it's uh, it's a function of recognition. And at this point, I think Barbara thinks they're cute. I don't think she really identifies them particularly as her own. And how are they with Barbara? Uh, This is amazing, Uh, obviously, the one that's six months old. Mackie. (laughs) Mackie. (laughs) You don't know from nothing. Uh, He's happy. Uh, And she thinks he's cute, and she will... He is cute. ...pet his head, (laughs) you know, uh, and and I'm happy. And I can see that uh, my daughter Jessica is happy even for that. Eddie is a smart kid. Yeah. And he learned early on that Bubby has a problem, yeah. you know, and at first, you know, she might yell at him or take a toy away or mm. do something that was just erratic or irrational. And he would cry, he would be upset. And we had to sort of monitor it pretty carefully, mm. more because he just didn't understand. You know, now if uh, he's with uh, Barbara and me and we go to a playground or something like that, which we do, he will wait for her. He will take her hand. He will, you know, incredibly uh, sympathetic. Um, so, you know, the transition is uh, amazing. And five, if, five-year-old caregiver. Five-year-old caregiver. And I spent time with him, and I'm sure his parents did too, that, you know, his grandma, you know, has some issues and she is not well and she may sometimes get angry yeah. or do something that right. he that she's, she's not mean. really angry she's with not you me being mean and she's not angry this is just you know something she can't help mm. and you could help her yeah you can help her by yeah helping her. that's the whole concept yeah. of help yourself by helping others yeah. so you know they that that part of uh, going out going to friends the same uh, making sure that they know what might be coming and being ready to disengage in a really nice way so that people, so it's never abrupt and they understand because you don't want it to be awkward for them. So as long as they know that this may happen. Well, uh, again, it is awkward, but it becomes less awkward the more you're in that situation. Right. Now, to the extent going out d- becomes more problematic. And we're, we're at a place now where we're not going to the movies. We're not yeah. going to the theater. Mm. We're not going to museums unless we could go where nobody's there or some facsimile thereof. Then everything is more 
you know, inside or around home. And so then, and technology does provide it, we replicate it. So we'll do movie night. Hey, Barb, you want to see a movie tonight? Yes. Okay, so we'll do a movie. You want popcorn? Yeah, let's make, yeah, yeah. Do Pop you make popcorn? We make popcorn. Oh, that's we made great. It last night. Nice. The same thing. Uh, the the orchestra. You know, we try to make it an event. Uh, the fact is that she may be diverted or close her eyes or fall asleep, but it is replicating in some way an experience that she used to have. Museums now, with the, you know the pandemic. One of the great gifts of the pandemic is it's opened all these collections and experiences and lectures to the world. Online. And online. Yeah. So we do all of it. Yeah. Whether she is getting it, you know, we're having an experience that we would have if we went to the museum. Of the that is the quintessential caregiver mindset. Do things that you will absolutely enjoy and Barbara is likely going to join in and enjoy it to whatever extent Right. She is capable. Or she thinks it's a great idea and within five minutes her eyes are closed and she's sitting next to me and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And when it's over and she's awake and I would say, wasn't that great? Did you enjoy that? And she'd say, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, so, nap, naps are good too. <laughs> naps are good. So uh, all of these things are... It is a combination of trying to plan on things that might provide some recall, some enjoyment, uh, but are all things, all things that serve your own interest as well. And just a reminder, the Sharegiver Solutions approach is to provide you, the Sharegiver, with a game plan. We're back to the game plan so that at the end of the movie, you're not sitting there fretting over what do we do now you already know what you're going to do now it's it's on your game plan with the understanding that that may not work the walk may not be the right thing or music or dancing or reading or whatever it might be then you either have a workaround or you have an alternate activity but you're prepared and that's what the game plan is really designed to avoid that anxiety. Yeah. Or what are we going to do for the next uh, five hours? I think it's your peace of mind is, you know, an, an important objective as yeah. well as something that is as edifying as possible uh, for, you know, your partner. And, you know, even when we talk about it and what we've been talking about, everything about share giving is in play. You're bringing mindset. It's like it doesn't leave you and it becomes more and more powerful and you start to employ it in everything you do. Yeah. It's a, a training. It's a mental training. Well, you, you become aware of your own mindset. Correct. And game plan and network. You're, yeah. You see more and more opportunity. So uh, uh, one final example on this is that we used to love going out for dinner socializing. Oh, okay, well, we can't really do that now. We can't go to a restaurant because Barbara will get up and then everybody will be disrupted because I'll keep saying, Barbara, you know, sit down. And then you'll and be then stressed other out. other diners, because she'll go to their table and she'll sort of pick something off the table. So we don't do that. But what we do is invite people over for dinner and they're Barbara can wander, but it becomes a regular part of our calendar. So, for example, before the pandemic, we were doing Shabbat dinners every Friday night. And uh, we would invite, and we'd have either, we'd have as many as 12 people come or as few as a couple, or sometimes even one person. But this was a social activity that we were doing. We were doing it once a week. And then the pandemic came, and interestingly, People, especially in my synagogue, wanted to know if they could help by bringing dinners on Friday. They would bring Shabbat dinner to us, uh, even though they couldn't share it with us. And at first I was a little taken aback, like, you don't really need to do that. And then I realized they want to do it. 
you mm. know, I'm allowing them to give. And that your menu's gotten a hell of a lot better. <laughs> I'm eating better. Well, this all started <laughs> when one of my women friends asked me what I was cooking that night for dinner. What, what, what do you have last night, she wanted to know. Leftover pizza. And I said, no. I said, I put a couple of francs in the microwave, with, opened a can of beans. She said, wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. I thought it was great. If you have mustard and sauerkraut, I'm good. Uh, so for the whole pandemic, they brought Friday night dinners. Now that we're all vaccinated, that same person that organized it said, do you still want people to come or are you prepared? Do you want to start your Shabbat dinners again? People, I think, really like that. Mm. that you could sit outside. They love your house. And I said, definitely. I said, with one difference, they now can bring dishes before I was doing it myself. So people can still bring dinner if they're coming. We had our first one this past Friday night with Kay and Louise. It was fabulous. Mm. They stayed for three hours and Barbara stayed the whole time. So it's a comprehensive situation. Your guests, they get conditioned. Yeah. They're not shocked anymore. And so it's, it's something for everybody out there. Understand that people will grow to understand the situation and even embrace the situation. Right. And I think everybody at that point benefits. Your load is lightened. Barbara is socially active. And the people who come to visit enjoy it for any number of reasons, not the least of which is to know they're doing something good. Right. And making Barbara happy. And they all, so yeah, Kay and Louise, they brought, what did they bring? They brought uh, cookies that they knew Barbara liked. They brought ice cream in little containers, coffee ice cream, Mom. which she loved. <laughs> And uh, even though, of course, she took the coffee ice cream and <laughs> walked away with it. It's but, okay. Uh, it was okay. So, you know, they were happy. I said, hey, Barb, we got coffee ice cream. And she said, you know, oh, good. Or, so, yeah, it's, uh, so we're not going out to a restaurant, we, but we're entertaining still. And it's a great opportunity. Well, you're also expanding and encouraging and developing your network. Yes, and I'm enjoying it. I'm talking and we're having a conversation. And if Barbara is not in it and it bothers her, you know, which it does because, you know, all she, feels she neglected. feels excluded. Yeah. She'll get up, do something. Yeah. And uh, then she'll come back. And, and, and you guys will have a, see that and, right. and you know, and it's cool. ring her back in or, or, or just understand. And that's what I mean about people becoming more accustomed to what had been an awkward and discomforting situation. Yeah, and accustomed and also seeing that we are going to, we're going to live our lives. We're going to make the best of it. We're not shuddering. Right. And, yeah. and they're a part of it. And they're a part of it. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. once again, thank you so much for listening. We hope this has been helpful. Right. And all of our, we have a library of all these podcasts, so any that you miss That's are correct. there. And they can also be heard on, you know, podcasts that... Wherever uh, you receive your podcasts. Yeah, Apple. Well, we would love you to stay committed. Uh, we assume you will because you're in it. You're, you're a share giver. And, and if you have anything that you want to share right now, we're... We're not yet set up to do it interactively. It's not a radio show, although we may have our broadcasts that are recorded live as well. But send us a question, who you are, and we can uh, address it. And in addition, if you know of somebody who is an exemplary share giver who you'd like to shine some light on, please let us know about them. Okay. Okay. See ya. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Shalom Bayat. Big picture. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you found the afternoon installment of A Day in the Life worthwhile, informative, and helpful, as well as enjoyable. If you have an opportunity, please visit the Sharegiver Solutions website at sharegiversolutions.com. Tell us who you are leave thoughts about sharegiving, and perhaps share a bit about your situation. 
As you might assume, next week we will examine what the evening looks like in David and Barbara's house. Until then, be well, share more, take care. Davey, let's sing. Let's do it. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Heaven, heaven, when I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Right on. Right on.